We're doing a study in the book of Psalms, selected Psalms, and today we're going to be in Psalm 8, one of my favorite Psalms of all. Uh, Psalm 8 is a praise Psalm. Here, David is the author, and he exalts God for his amazing creation and also for his amazing grace that would appoint us at the very top of his creation. Now, you think about that. Why would God do that? Why would he honor us like that? Well, it's all part of God's redemptive plan that is centered in Jesus Christ, who is the ultimate fulfillment of our humanity. He is the ultimate man. So as we go through this psalm, just like we were singing praise songs, expect to be uh, lifted up, inspired, encouraged, as we look at God's wonderful plan for each of us that will be fulfilled through Jesus Christ. As I said, David is the author of Psalm 8, and as he writes, he's going to weave back and forth between praising God for his marvelous creation and praising God for his marvelous plan that would put humanity, us, in charge of his creation. And so let's look at it. Let's get started. Let's begin with the greatness of God, which is found in verse 1, and then the last verse in Psalm 8, verse 9. So both the first verse and the last verse ends with the same expression of praise, which is, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. David's praise is centered on Yahweh Adonai. You're saying, who? Well, O Lord, our Lord, the first word in the Hebrew is Yahweh, that's why in my New American Standard Bible, it's capitalized, all the letters. It means that in the Hebrew, that's Yahweh, the sacred name of God. He is the one who is the great I Am, who revealed himself to Moses and gave himself that name. I am that I am. That's Yahweh. That's God's sacred name, especially in relationship to Israel, Yahweh. It means that he is the eternal, self-existing one. He doesn't depend on anything or anyone. He has always been and always will be. That is who God is. The second Lord is Adonai. Adonai emphasizes God's right to rule. It emphasizes that he is the sovereign king of this universe, the ruler of this universe. So even as king of Israel, which is what King David was, the king of Israel, he recognizes that he is a servant of God Most High, Yahweh Adonai. He's willing to submit himself to God, even though he is a ruler over his nation, he is a servant to God. Folks, wouldn't, don't you wish that more world leaders today would recognize that and have that same attitude and be willing to submit to the one true God? Wouldn't we be better off if that was true? But instead, we see such arrogancy today. So David, even though he is king, recognizes that he's nothing but a servant before God Most High, Yahweh Adonai, Lord our Lord. And then he says, how majestic is your name in all the earth. I love that expression, how majestic. The word majestic indicates someone who commands respect because of his awesome power, majestic in power. This power, as David expresses, is displayed in all the earth. God's power, you just look on a beautiful day like today, and we see his glory, his power displayed in so many ways. God is majestic, and then he follows that up with a parallel line that says, who has who have displayed your splendor above the heavens. The phrase is literally, upon the heavens, God has displayed his splendor. This means God's glory, his splendor is observable. We can see it with our own eyes. The word splendor means magnificent in appearance, awesome in grandeur and beauty. Isn't it true right now here in this June month Everywhere you look, you see the beauty of God's creation. It's it's all around us, the splendor, the glory. And this is also true 
at night when you look up at the stars and see the magnitude of our universe. Think of the last time you stayed up late enough to look at the stars at night. For some of us, it's past our bedtime, right? But I want to encourage you to do that. And when you look up at that star on a clear starry sky on a clear night, it's amazing. It's awesome. We can't even imagine it, how great it is, what God has created. The size and distance of our universe is just too great for us to even imagine or contemplate. We talk in terms of light year. How long is a light year? It's just incredibly, it's distance too far for our finite minds to understand. Mathematically, we can kind of state it, but we can't comprehend it. That's our universe. And when you compare the vastness of our universe to us, we seem infinitesimally small and insignificant. And that's David's amazement. And that's his theme here in Psalm 8, comparing the greatness of God and the greatness of his creation to the insignificance of man and why God would honor us and exalt us in the way that he has. David was just amazed, as we're going to see. And this brings us now to the frailty of our humanity. In verse 2 of Psalm 8, David writes, From the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have established strength because of your adversaries, your enemies, to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. Now, this second verse is kind of hard to understand. What's David saying here? From the mouth of babes, you have established strength so that your adversaries would be defeated and the revengeful cease? What is he saying? Well, best we can possibly understand it is that God, by his sovereign grace, has chosen to defeat his enemies, think Satan, by means of weak, frail humanity like us. That is the essence of what David is saying. He's setting up a contrast. David goes from God's greatness as seen in his creation, think universe, to our weakness as helpless babes and how God in his ingenious wisdom and power brings about the defeat of his enemies, Satan and company, through our frail humanity. Do you remember what Jesus said when Paul complained about his thorn in the flesh? In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, three times, Paul complained about some kind of a physical ailment. It may have involved his eyesight. We don't know for sure. Three times he asked God to remove it from him. Do you remember what Jesus' response was? My power, my grace is perfected in your weakness. That's Psalm 8. That is what David is is saying here. He is extolling God's grace and wisdom that he would choose our weakness to display his power in defeating his enemies. It is through our weakness that God displays his strength. In verse 2, we also see this figures of speech being used to display God's advance against evil, evil, how he defeats his enemies. He says, from the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have established, that is, demonstrated your strength. When God says, out of the mouth of babes, He's talking about giving praise. That's what out of the mouth refers to, giving praise to God. Nursing babes, by the way, and you all know this, do not use words to praise God. Would we agree with that? Uh, I've got a 10-month at home, and all he's good for is goo-goo-ga-ga and a few other nonsensical words. You know, they kind of speak gibberish. It's cute, it's loud, but they don't say words of praise. All they can do is make funny noises. All infants can do that. So when he talks about out of the mouth of babes, this is a metaphor for God's people, for us. When we gather together and praise God, our worship, think of this, our singing together is a declaration that our God reigns. Amen? And that's what we're declaring The world out there may not recognize that, but we in here recognize it. David depicts God's people as helpless children, as babes, as infants, because without God's help, you know what? Compared to Satan, we are helpless, 
infants. So the weak and helpless babes are us, humble worshipers whose singing of God will be used by God, and this is what's exciting, to help bring about the defeat of his enemies. It's amazing to contemplate. Think of it. Praise is one of the ways that we defeat the devil. Imagine that. When we come together on a Sunday morning, they're singing, great is our God, like we just sang. That Satan cringes. The demons flee. At his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, if you remember when Jesus came in riding on a colt of a donkey, the people started shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, praise to the Lord, praise the Lord, Hosanna to him in the highest. Psalm 8-2 was quoted by Jesus when the people were shouting that. If you remember, the, the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders, were upset by the people. And when they said to Jesus, you hear what these children, notice the word used, these children are saying, do you hear what they're saying, these children? And Jesus said, yes, I do. Have you not read? He said, out of the mouth, and then he quotes Psalm 8-2, our psalm, verse 2. He says, out of the mouth of nursing or infants and nursing babes, you are prepared praise for yourself. Jesus said that in Matthew 21, 16. He is quoting Psalm 8. And what this means, God uses, think about this, God uses our praise to defeat the enemy. That's why we need to praise God throughout our day and especially when we gather together. There is strength when we praise God. Not only it recalibrates our soul and lifts our souls to realize there's a great God involved in our lives, but it sends a message to the demons, to Satan himself, about his ultimate defeat, that God is the victor. God triumphs over his enemies by means of weak and frail people like us who recognize our weakness and therefore depend on God and give him the praise. That's why it's Psalm 8, too, is telling us. And then... This brings us now to the heart of Psalm 8, David's amazement, verses 3 through 8. Picture David on his patio looking up at the stars on a clear night. And as he gazes at the stars, verses 3 through 8, we read, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man? that you have taken thought of him, and the son of man, that you care for him. Yet you have made him a little lower than God. You have crowned him with glory and majesty. You have made him to rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, also the beasts of the field, the birds of heaven, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the past, that is the currents of the oceans." You are put under submission, dominion to man. David's reaction here is astonishment, utter amazement that God would create such an infinite universe and delegate the rule of that universe to insignificant creatures like us, humanity. Think of it. If you were God, think of that moment, if you were God and you created your universe, would you put man, knowing what you know about man, in charge of it? No way. No way. But God did. And we call that grace. We call that grace. And that's what has David amazed. What is man that you would exalt him like this? What is man that you would appoint him as custodial stewards over your creation. What is man? David is amazed, and it should amaze us, that God in his grace would bestow thee such honor and glory on us to be rulers, caretakers over his creation. I want to break down what David says here by making some points here. Let's look at three important details. First of all, notice who the heavens belong to. Who do the heavens belong to? 
David is clear when he says, they belong to God. David says, when I consider your heavens and the work of your fingers, God is the creator. So everything in this universe owes its existence to God. It belongs to him. We belong to him. If you're taking notes, Psalm 100 verse 3 underscores this. It says, God who made us and we are the sheep of his pasture. I love that. It's his pasture and we are his sheep. We belong to God. Second, notice David's amazement. What is man? What is humanity that such an infinite, powerful God would stoop and concern himself with such weak and frail creatures such as us? Why? Why does God care about us? Do we care about ants? Did any of you have this morning a prayer for the ants of this world? No, we don't care about ants. Do we care about slugs and bugs? No, but God cares about us. And compared to him, we are less, less than a bug in a rug. Why would God care about such insignificant creatures such as you and I, such as us? And folks, as I said, it's called grace. God's love for us speaks more about who he is, his love, his character, than it does about us and our merit. Amen, folks? Amen? Amen. We need to recognize that. Don't feel so entitled. Be grateful. Third, third point. Notice the expressions David uses to indicate how God has honored us. The expressions. He says, God has made us, one, a little lower than the heavenly beings. The first part of verse 5. The word used by David is Elohim in the Hebrew. Elohim. You've made us a little lower than the Elohim. That word, depending on the context, can be translated as God, capital G, God himself, or it can refer to gods, false gods. But here, in this context, it more than likely refers to angelic beings, heavenly beings, angels. Angels. You've made us a little lower than heavenly beings, angels. Just a trifle less than heavenly beings. Think of that. And yet one day, the Apostle Paul tells us, one day we're going to rule over the angels. Imagine that. Think about that. 1 Corinthians 6, 3 tells us that, that one day we will rule, judge the angels. Second point he makes, he says, expression, he says, God has crowned us with glory and majesty. The second part of verse 5. When you look at the stars and see their glory, imagine that one day you're going to shine brighter than the stars in heaven in your resurrection body. Isn't that amazing? That one day our glory will exceed even that of the stars in heaven. Glory and majesty refers to God's commission to us to rule over his creation. By God's grace, we are set apart from God's creation, to rule over what he has created. And this brings us to the next point. He says, notice the next expression. God has appointed us to rule over the works of his hands. Verse 6. That's our commission. We are to be good stewards of what God has created. And then the next point. God has put all things under his feet. Second part of verse 6. This dominion extends to animals and birds and the fish in the sea. The point is, is that God has set us apart from his creation. That is how he has honored us. Folks, who is man's closest relative? Think about that. Who is man's closest relative? It's not a monkey. Your closest relative is God. You are created in his image. And we must never forget that. We are created in God's image. People who believe in evolution may teach you different, but don't you believe it for a moment. One of the biggest lies passed upon us in modern times has been evolution. And when I talk about evolution, let me clarify I'm talking about macro evolution, where one species becomes another species. Specifically, 
macroevolution believes that we all started off as tadpoles and developed into some kind of walking or crawling critter and then developed in eventually into monkeys and then eventually developed into humans. That is a lie. Absolute lie. It's a fairy tale. If a princess kisses a frog and the frog suddenly becomes a prince, what do we call that? A fairy tale. You add millions and hundreds of millions of years and suddenly we think that's science. There is no archaeological rest record in the fossils. There is no demonstrated or anything that shows that one species becomes another species. That is a lie made up by those who refuse to believe in God, and yet it's taught to our kids. Now, microevolution, we see all the time. Microevolution means we adapt. Creatures will adapt and adjust and develop. Over time, horses have become bigger. We become bigger. I don't know about smarter, but we become bigger. But that's microevolution, adapting, developing. That's different than one species becoming another. And people today, so many today, and maybe, frankly, if you're one of them, I want to encourage you and help you to understand that isn't the narrative. That isn't the truth. You've been taught that. But we didn't evolve from nothing. Something doesn't come from nothing. Would you agree with that? Design demands a designer. The complexity of this universe is incredible. And to think it just happened, it takes more faith to believe in that. Crazy faith. Unbased, uh, unscientifically based faith to believe in that than to believe that God is the creator and the designer of this universe. And so David is recognizing God as our creator. And all things one day will be put under his feet. We can apply that to ourselves, ultimately even our dominion. Why would God do that? But this is where Psalm 8, and I want to point this out. Psalm 8 is not just a praise psalm. It's a messianic psalm. It talks about Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of all things being put under his feet. That is a picture of total dominion. It's a key theme in the New Testament. Let me give you some verses. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 27. 1 Corinthians 15, 27 applies Psalm 8, 6 to Jesus and one day ruling over all. He does this also in Ephesians 1.22. He also, the author of Hebrews, does this in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 10. Jesus is the ultimate expression of Psalm 8. He's the ultimate fulfillment of humanity's destiny because He is humanity at its highest. And He reveals our ultimate destiny to rule with him over all of God's creation, including the angels. Think about that. And what this means very simply is Jesus is the center of God's redemptive plan. He is the center. And one day all things will be as his footstool, under his feet, speaking of dominion. Now, right now, we don't see all things under Jesus' feet. Instead, we see resistance. We see rebellion. Think of the world leaders and the nations Think of the opposition against God and against Jesus that we see today. But one day, and one day soon, Jesus is going to return. Mark my words. He's going to come. And he will claim his title, his role as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he will turn all things right and make all things right. So God's redemptive plan is centered in Jesus. And this brings us now to David's closing praise. Again, a repeat or a refrain from verse 1. In verse 9, David says, O oh Lord, this is said with awe and humility. O oh Lord, Yahweh, our Lord, Adonai, our leader, our ruler, our king. How majestic is your name in all the earth. The triune God is pictured here. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. All three members of the Trinity are worthy of all praise and all glory in all the earth for His wisdom and power in creating such a marvelous creation. 
and such a marvelous plan of redemption through Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory. That's what Psalm 8 is all about. Someone wise and creative compared Psalm 8 to a theater production. You'll see in your notes if you have some outline there. It's like a play or an epic story being told. It's humanity's story. God writes and directs the script. He wrote this play or this uh, production before the world began. He had in mind what he was going to do. We call it his redemptive plan. The prologue, the beginning, praise to God for his wisdom and power. I imagine an orchestra playing uplifting, praiseworthy music. Then we have a cast, and the cast consists of God, his people, and his enemies. Think Satan and all those who oppose God. The plot, the central plot, is the struggle for universal domination. Who is going to rule this universe, Satan or Jesus? And we know the answer. The protagonists, the leading characters in this play, are us, us, when we recognize our need for God and turn to Him. The antagonist, antagonist means the enemy or foe, is Satan and all those who oppose God. And the hero of the story, well, who's the hero of the story? It's, what's the safe answer in any Sunday school class or in church? It's Jesus. Jesus is the hero of the story. All things are going to be one day submitted under his feet. That's the outcome. In the end, all things are brought into subjection to Jesus. That's where human history is going. That's where we're going. The epilogue, again, uplifting music, praise to God for his wisdom and power. It's a beautiful story. God's creation story. The redemptive story. And folks, all of us, all of us play a part in that story. All of us. We can either be a protagonist or an antagonist. We can either be a friend or a foe. We can either submit our hearts to Jesus now or be forced to do so when he comes again. It's your choice. But the consequences are eternal. So let's choose Jesus. Let's choose to surrender our lives to him so that we can one day reign with him when he comes again and takes his rightful place. Until then, let's just praise God for his redemptive plan that is centered in Jesus. That's what we're to be doing. Recognizing that even though things seem chaotic today and going out of control, God is in control. And one day, Jesus is going to come and make all things right. All things will be subjected like a footstool under his feet. My assignment for you may be difficult for some of us, but my assignment to you this week is to go out on a clear night, you got to stay up, and look at the stars. In view of Psalm 8, look at this vast universe that we have and think and imagine, contemplate that one day our glory is going to be greater than the stars above. Think about that. Let it fill you with wonder that because of Jesus Christ and our resurrection bodies, our glory will be greater than that of the stars in heaven. And we owe it all to Jesus, all to Him. Praise be to Him. Now, folks, I want to just also indicate that the narrative today that many of you are already aware of and you'll be hearing more about, is that the climate change that we hear talked about is caused by humans. Now, certainly we can contribute to the pollution, but it's all humanity's fault. And the thing that we need to do is reduce the herd. We have too many humans. And humans by nature are polluters. And because they don't, the secularists don't believe there is a God... There's this idea, this narrative going that we have no more right. We're not appointed as anything special over creation. We have no more right than a tree or a bush or a frog or a a monkey. And that this earth would be better off, many believe, many believe, without humanity. And that we're the problem. Now, it's true that we are 
We can be polluters, and there have been pollution caused by humanity through the years. But as we try and correct that and live responsibly, what I find ironic is those who are telling us to reduce our carbon footprint are often these millionaires and billionaires who fly their private jets around the world. And yet they're telling us we got to reduce our carbon footprint. Now, let me just clarify here. I believe we should all be responsible stewards of this beautiful planet God has given us. We should all always try and keep it as clean as we can. I want clean air. I want clean water. How about you? We all do. But the narrative, the narrative on the secular side is that humanity is a curse and we've got to take measures. And so you're going to start seeing, because if you really believe that climate change is an existential threat, that's the phrase used. Existential means life ending. If you believe that climate change global warming is an existential threat in the next 10 years, then you'll do anything in order to keep that from happening. And their their message of what to do, that's where it gets dangerous. So I just want you to be aware. Yes, we need to be responsible stewards of all that God has given us. But we are crowned with glory and honor, Psalm 8 says. We are the highest expression of God's creation. One day we're going to rule over even angels. So don't demean yourself. And don't buy in to the narrative of today that has a secular viewpoint, not a God-centered viewpoint. And remember to live for God and to praise Jesus because one day we will reign with Him. And that's what we get to look forward to. Amen? Amen? Let's bow our heads in prayer, shall we? Father, uh, I just thank you for Psalm 8 and King David and his insight. What is man that that would give him such attention and honor and glory to appoint humanity over your creation? we're, We're still amazed. It's a great responsibility, and sometimes we haven't always handled it well. But Father, help us to be good stewards in our own lives, in our own way. But help us to realize that things will never be right until Jesus comes and takes his rightful place. We don't need to thin the herd. We don't need the elite trying to tell us what to do or how to live. We need you, Jesus, to be in charge. And I pray that more and more world leaders, more and more of our own politicians would do what David did and recognize your rulership in their lives, that they would be willing to submit to you I pray that we are willing to do that right here, right now. I pray that every heart is willing to say, Lord Jesus, I put my faith, my trust in you. I believe you created this planet and you had a redemptive purpose for this planet and it's centered in you, Jesus. And I put my faith and trust in you. Help me to love others everywhere I go, but to live with courage, faith, and hope and love, always. I pray, Father, for this, your people, that we would rise up and be good stewards, but also courageous followers of Jesus in this difficult and crazy time in which we live. Help us to be clear about the truth and to stand for the truth and not be intimidated by others. We ask your blessing now in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.